Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you all to the webinar of ICSI IIT that is Final Word on IBC 10. Today we have with us Mr. Nilesh Sharma and Mr. Ashish Makhija as faculties. We shall discuss three Supreme Court cases today. That is in the matter of Anuj Jain Interim Resolution Professional for JP Infratech Limited versus Excess Bank Limited, Civil Appeal Number 8512 to 8527 of 2019. Second is in the matter of Tata Consultancy Services Limited versus Vishal. Gisulal Jain Resolution Professional SK Wheels Private Limited Civil Appeal Number 3045 of 2020. And the third is in the matter of EPIC Singapore Private Limited versus Committee of Creators of Educom Solutions Limited and another's Civil Appeal Number 3224 of 2020. The first session will be taken by Mr. Nilesh Sharma. I'll provide you a brief introduction of Mr. Nilesh Sharma. Mr. Nilesh Sharma is practicing in the area of restructuring and insolvency for over 25 years. He has been representing a number of clients before different ventures of NCLT and NCLAT on a regular basis and has been providing strategic advisory and consultancy to a large number of industrial groups on debt restructuring within and outside CDR mechanism, negotiated settlements, restructuring and or reorganization under insolvency proceedings. BIFR restructuring and or reorganization under Section 391 to 394 of Companies Act 2013, insolvency, bankruptcy, liquidation, winding up proceedings under Companies Act, insolvency and bankruptcy court, etc. He is a member of Insol India. His articles on restructuring and insolvency has been published in various national and international law journals. He was rated as one of the leading lawyer in the field of restructuring and insolvency by various reputed international journals. Journals like Legal 500, Chambers and Partners, Asia Law Profiles, IFLR 1000, etc., for many years in a row. He's a regular speaker at various seminars on various topics on insolvency and bankruptcy code 2016. So you may now start the session. Nilesh sir, am I audible to you? Uh, yes, uh, good evening, uh, everyone. So I have prepared one uh, PPT on this particular topic. Uh, so I have already shared it. Hope you can see it on your screen. Can you see it on your screen, please? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. Okay, okay, okay. So let's start. Huh? So as you know that uh, today's... Uh, Topic is uh, the Supreme Honorable Supreme Court judgment uh, in the matter of Anu Jain, IRP JP Infratech versus Access Bank Limited. And uh, it was in the matter of uh, GP Infra, GP Infratech Limited. And uh, the main uh, issues which were involved in this particular matter were uh, so, in brief, let me tell you what were the facts and uh, then what were the issues involved. So, as you know, that JP Infra Limited uh, was under insolvency, and JP Infra Limited was a was a subsidiary of JP Associates Limited. Uh, so, JP Infra uh, Limited we will call as JIL, and JP Associates Limited as JAL. So, JAL raised some uh, loans on the security on the mortgage of the assets owned by JIL. And that was prior to the prior to initiation of insolvency process in respect of JIL. And then, uh, when these uh, uh, these loans were raised, 
uh, when these loans were raised, so actually at that point of time, even uh, IBC was not yet notified. You know that with the from 1st December 2016, uh, the provisions of IBC were notified. And then when the CIRP initiated for uh, JP Infratech Limited, uh, in the insolvency process, the lenders of uh, uh, secure the lenders of GAL, they filed mainly ICSA Bank and Access Bank Limited. They filed uh, their claims as a as a financial creditor, as a secured financial creditor of GIL. Huh? So, which was not accepted by the IRP. IRP said that you have not dispersed any money. The loan is rose, not raised. You are not even a creditor of this company. You are not a creditor of JIL. You have lent the money to JIL. Uh, so you are a creditor of JIL. I have, you, have, you are holding my security. You are holding my land as a security for the said loan. Okay, but I am not having any debt. I am not having any debt payable to you in my books of account. Uh, so on the basis of this ground, the, the claim was uh, dismissed. Then there was another issue. The issue was that this mortgage was created in favor of JIL, where the money has not come to JIL. So the and JIL was uh, 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 there was some uh, uh, Sir, can't hear you. Voice is not coming, sir. We are not hearing. Um, I'm calling the faculty. One second. I got disconnected, huh? Can you see it? Can you see the presentation? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can hear you also. Okay, okay, okay. Huh. So I was explaining to you uh, that. Uh, the one issue was that IRP or RP, he did not accept the claim of Axis Bank and ICSA Bank Limited. I think uh, you, you, you could hear me until that point of time? Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. And then the second issue was that uh, RP said that uh, this particular security, which has been created in favor of JP Infra and JP, JP Associates, and JP Associates was, was a 
uh, operational predator in the books of uh, JP Infra Limited. Okay, so he said that this has been, this security has been created in your favor. You are a creditor, JP Associates, you are a creditor. And so I will treat it as a preferential transaction. Okay, so he said he filed an application before Honorable NCLT and this creation of mortgage. Uh, so he said that it's a preferential transaction. So it, it should be set aside. It should be declared as null and void. Honorable NCLT agreed with the same. Then NCLT, an uh, appeal was filed before Honorable NCLT by these creditors and Honorable NCLT, uh, NCLT said that no, and Honorable NCLT set aside that order of NCLT. And then after that, IRP, he filed uh, this uh, uh, appeal before Honorable Supreme Court. So this is, these are two issues. So one issue is relating to uh, treating this creation of charge in favor of the lenders of JL as a preferential transaction. So this was one issue before Honorable Supreme Court. And another issue was whether, and uh, coming back to that issue, where these lenders of JAL, lenders of JAL, they filed a claim before IRP, claiming themselves to uh, be the financial creditor, secured financial creditor of JIL, which IRP said, no, you are not a creditor, you are not a financial creditor. Then application was uh, filed by these creditors before Honorable NCLT and Honorable NCLT said, no, you are not a financial creditor. Then they approached Honorable uh, uh, NCLT and then Honorable NCLT set aside NCLT's order. Then again, this matter, this issue also went to Honorable Supreme Court. So this particular judgment deals with these two issues, uh, whether the creation of charge in favor of creditors, in, in favor of lenders of GAL should be treated as a, uh, a preferential transaction. And second is those financial, those creditors of GAL, whether they can be treated as credit, financial creditors of uh, of GIL. So these were the two issues and very important issues were there. And most importantly, this particular issue, interpretation of section five, sub, uh, clause eight, that as, uh, as to whether these creditors can be treated as financial creditors. So what is the meaning of financial creditor and how this definition has been interpreted by Honorable Supreme Court. So I think there is no other judgment on this particular aspect as to who should be treated as a financial creditor. And uh, uh, according to me, this is the only judgment which interpret, interprets section five sub, uh, clause eight. Huh? So now let's see what, 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 uh, 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 what were the findings, what were the issues. So parties of the case, JP Infra, J Prakash Associates, Anuj Jain was the IRP. India Infrastructure, Infrastructure Finance Company Limited was actually a creditor of JIL who challenged this issue of treating them uh, as a creditor. The, according to IIFCL, uh, the creditors of JIL should not be treated as financial creditors. And other, other banks of JIL, uh, especially ICSA Bank and Access Bank. So these facts we are aware the JAL, as I told you, the JAL was the holding company of JIL and JIL was referred to insolvency process. And then admission of that application took place on 9th of August, 2017. Okay, so first uh, uh, December, 2016, this law was notified. And then immediately, I think within, within uh, uh, approximately nine months, this particular matter of uh, GIL was referred to or was admitted actually uh, by Honorable NCLT. So 51% of the more than 50% of the 1% of the equity was with GIL and that equity was also mortgaged in favor of the lenders. Huh? And you are aware that this particular project, actually this particular project, Yamna Expressway project, huh, which links uh, Noida with uh, Agra, uh, so that project was actually allotted to GAL uh, because at that point of time, GAL was not in existence. Uh, so it was given to GAL and GAL then formed this subsidiary, uh, GIL. So it was a special purpose vehicle for the purpose of execution of this particular project. Okay, And then 
JAL invested money in the company uh, equity and uh, then raised loan for the purpose of this particular project and all. Hmm? And in consideration of development of this project, you know that uh, a huge piece of land was given to uh, JAL for the purpose of uh, developing a uh, township, huh? Re developing a real estate, uh, developing two real estate projects, one with the name Wish Town and uh, Wish Town Noida and another in Mirjapur. Huh? So these were the facts. Then after that, the land which was mortgaged, uh, that was 850 acres of immovable, immovable property owned by, uh, old, owned by JIL was mortgaged in favor of uh, JIL's creditors. NCLT allowed, uh, so IRP, uh, so the IDBA bank instituted, so this, this uh, CIRP was initiated by IDBA Bank Limited and then IRP made an application seeking direction that the transactions entered into by the directors and promoters of CD, creating mortgage of 855, 858 acres of immobile property owned by it to secure the debt of JL are preferential, undervalued, wrongful and fraudulent. Hence, the security interest created by CD in favor of lenders of JL be discharged and such properties be deemed to be vested in the corporate data. Uh, so, as I have already explained to you, that this was one of the issues that these assets, uh, the, this particular transaction or mortgage uh, is a preferential transaction. And a number of arguments were taken against this particular issue. So, they said that uh, I, I, we will come to that, uh, those things. Huh? NCLT allowed the said application on 16th May 2018 with respect to six of the impune transactions covering about 758 acres. So total issue was relating to 858 acres, but uh, NCLT found that 758 acres of land was uh, covered by the transactions which uh, fell within the ambit of preferential transaction. So other 100 acres, I think, must have been prior to uh, this two years limitation. Huh? So you know that with respect to a uh, related party. So we have to see two years transactions, two years transactions, transactions within the last two financial year, uh, two, two, two years, not financial years, two years preceding the insolvency commencement date. Okay, so 100 acres must not have uh, fallen within that uh, time period. NCLT by its impugned order dated uh, 1st August 2019 set aside the order passed by NCLT and held that such lenders of JL were entitled to exercise their rights under the code. So they said that uh, this was not, NCLAT said that no, these were transactions uh, in the ordinary course of the business. Huh? So these should not be covered by the, by the definition of preferential transaction. So the order of NCLT was, uh, was set aside. So issue uh, before uh, Honorable uh, Supreme Court also, these were the issues whether the transaction in question deserve to be avoided as being preferential, undervalued and fraudulent transaction in terms of section 43, 45 and 66, and whether the respondents, respondents were Access Bank and ICSA Bank who were lenders of JAL, whether they could be recognized as financial creditors of the CD on the strength of the mortgage created by the CD as collateral security of the debt of its holding company JAL. Huh? So these were the two questions before Honorable Supreme Court. So reasoning and finding of NCLT and order, uh, I think we can we can we can see uh, this uh, uh, the colored portion being aggrieved by the decision so taken by the IRP. So as I told you that first we are examining this particular issue, the transaction, uh, and uh, this was the relating to the uh, security interest in the properties and questions have been fully so the respondent lenders can't say that they are the creditors of commercial company that owns owes money and they can't say, say that they could be treated as financial creditor okay so then agreed by the decision so taken by irp the said banks preferred separate application under section 65 while asserting their claim to be recognized as financial creditors. So IRP did not treat, treat them as financial creditors. So this order was, this decision of IRP was challenged by way of an application, by way of an IA before NCLT. NCLT rejected the application so filed by the banks. So NCLT said, whatever IRP has done by not treating you as a financial creditor, he has done correctly. Huh? So, so NCLT did not give any relief to
Hmm? Okay, then NCLT uh, said after having heard the parties and having scanned through the report, held that, held that transaction in questions were to defraud the lenders of the CD as 858 acres of unencumbered land owned by the corporate debtor to secure the debt of the related party was mortgaged in the mid midst of the corporate debtor's immense financial crunch. While continuing with default was the home buyers and financial creditors, and after it had been declared as LP. So, on the NCLT side, by these transactions, this uh, creation of this security, uh, G, you are GIL was, uh, GIL was uh, committing default to its financial creditor, uh, but you are giving your land for securing the debt of your uh, holding company. Uh, so they said that no, it was not a uh, uh, reasonable uh, transaction. It was not a proper uh, transaction. Tribunal was of the view that at the time when the mortgage was created, the CD was already in default to its lender and was unlikely that lender would have provided no objection for this to secure the debt of a related party as that would have compromised not only the recovery of their deals, but also the interest of uh, hundreds of home buyers. Okay, then... With respect to section 43, NCLT held that transaction of creating a security interest by way of mortgage in favor of the lenders of third party on the unencumbered land of the CD without any consideration or counter guarantee cannot be treated as transfer in the ordinary course of business or financial affair of the corporate debtor. Uh, so they said that it's a tra transaction which fell under, under this one, uh, uh, preferential transaction. As regards relevant time for the purpose of subsection 4, the court, the tribunal observed that court itself has provided. So now question which was raised, another question which was raised was even before NCLT. They said that 9th August 2017 was the date of admission and last two years transactions you were covering. Uh, last two years transactions you were covering. So transaction commencing from uh, August 2015, you were trying to cover, but law came into force only with effect from 1st December 2016. So you can't give rest retrospective effect to this law. So they said that there, there can't be this intention to cover the transactions which were prior to, prior to notification of this particular law. So this was the plea which was taken. Uh, but finally, Honorable Supreme Court said, no, the law clearly provided when in 2016, this law came. So at that point of time, law said that last two years transactions were covered. So definitely there was an intention of legislature that transactions prior to 1st December 2016 will be covered. Uh, so normally, as you know, that normally a law is having prospective uh, uh, effect. But if it is specifically provided therein, that it will have retrospective effect, then it, it can have retrospective effect also. Okay. So, and we are, we are talking about, especially we are talking about uh, our civil law. Huh? So, uh, so this plea was taken, which was not accepted by Honorable Supreme Court. Huh? So, uh, let me read this again. Relevant time for the purpose of subsection 4 of section 43. So, you know that section 43, subsection 4, prescribes the relevant time and relevant time in, re in respect of related parties two years prior to ICD and one year in respect of unrelated parties. And because this party was a related party, so last two years transactions were covered. The tribunal observed that the court itself has provided a retrospective effect to the provisions of section 43.4a, wherein it is stated that it is, it is given to a related party during two years preceding the ICD. This, according to NCLT, indicates that the retrospective effect is laid down in the legislation itself. And thus, the look back period for the transaction was made dependent on the ICD and not the date when the I IBC came into effect. The tribunal therefore held the transaction of a related party, the look back period of two years preceding ICD, and hence the relevant period for examining the transaction in question would be from 10th August 2015 to 9th August 2017 and not from 1st December 2016, huh? date of commencement of CRP, so two years prior to the same. Appeal before Honorable NCLAT, so I, I told you that uh, with respect to this transaction, uh, preferential transaction thing, uh, uh, Honorable uh, uh, NCLAT uh, said 
that it was a transaction in the ordinary course of business because that was a parent company and that parent company uh, the, was set up this company as a as is uh, as a uh, this one as a uh, special purpose vehicle even project was uh, provided or project was awarded to to the holding company only uh, so so subsidiary company if this type of transactions are there and holding company has supported this company hmm? so this these are normal kinds of transactions where group companies uh, uh, debts are secured by giving guarantee or by giving security and all. So honorable NCLAT said that it, it is a reasonable transaction. And they set aside, NCLAT set aside the order of NCLT. Uh, and both the orders, the order relating to the uh, another order was where the uh, these two bankers, uh, the bankers, they, they, they wanted to get them declared as financial creditor. Uh, and NCLT has rejected that. So they filed uh, that uh, 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 appeal before Honorable NCLT and Honorable NCLT, I think without giving much justification, said that no, they have to be treated as financial creditor. So set aside the order of uh, NCLT. Then, so some portions of uh, NCLT order we can quickly go through. Uh, I think we are not having much time. So better will be let's go directly to Supreme Court judgment. Huh? Huh. So these we have already discussed that these were the two issues which were uh, there for determination by the Honorable Supreme Court. So I think uh, before coming to this one, uh, uh, better is uh, let me uh, let me go to section 58 wala part because that is very, very important. I will come to this first question later. But for five eight, let me <clears throat> Second issue. So now, the so, so whether this particular uh, lender, the lenders of JAL, they should be treated as financial creditors of JAL. So that was the second issue before Honorable Supreme Court. And uh, the as you know that. Uh, ICSA Bank and uh, Access Bank Limited, they, they sought inclusion in the category of financial creditor. Uh, IRP did not agree. And then NCLT, uh, so we, that we have already discussed. Then uh, this one, the interpretation of Section 58. So Honorable Supreme Court said, uh, they, they said that see the definition which is there under Section 58. So you will see the definition uh, under Section 58. Uh, I'm having that here in I think in a much later part. So this definition, uh, if you see it, it is having two components. One component is which start the financial debt means, and then at the end of the definition, it says and includes. Uh, so two, two components are there of this definition, means and includes. Uh, so definitions normally uh, are of three kinds. One, Whenever under, under an enactment, the definitions are there. So normally it is given as such and such, and such term means such and such. Okay, so the word means is there. So when, when defining a particular term, the word means is there. Second kind of definitions are where the word includes is written. So for example, that if they say that financial debts include such and such. So that is a definition with the words includes. And then the third kind of definitions are which, which use both the uh, uh, words, means and includes also. So the definition which is there under section 5.8, it, it has included both the, term, both, both the words, means also and includes also. And the, 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 what is the <coughs> meaning of that uh, uh, term? If a definition says that a particular term means such and such, so that means that is an exhaustive definition. Means the definition will the apply 
a particular thing will fall within the definition only when when that particular definition is fulfilled not otherwise huh? so for example if we see 58 financial debt means a debt along with interest if any which is disbursed against the consideration for the time value of money so this is first part of the definition which is which uses the word means huh? so that means the this part of uh, definition so if anything has to fall within the meaning of financial debt then it must comply with this this definition unless and until that uh, particular thing falls within complies with or uh, with the uh, within this meaning uh, so that will not be otherwise that will not be treated as a financial debt so it has to comply with it has to uh, uh, meet this definition then only it can be second part is so financial and then second definition so this is called exhaustive definition second part of definition is includes so that is inclusive definition or what we call that extensive definition so includes means the definition includes such and such item but there can be others also huh? so these these are the items which are included in this definition but that is not exhaustive there can be other things also huh? And when we use both the terms means and includes, so it is defining the word means, the definition should is such and such, and it includes some, uh, some items. Huh? So it is so third kind of definitions include both means and includes. So th that particular this third kind of definition, uh, they have been interpreted by Honorable Supreme Court in this particular judgment. Hmm? So let's see. First, I will read this judgment, uh, this uh, definition for you. Financial debt means a debt along with interest, if any, which is dispersed against the consideration for the time value of money. So the Supreme Court says that this is the important part of definition which must be fulfilled. If some debt has to fall within the ambit of financial debt, then it must comply with this requirement. And what is the requirement? which is dispersed against the consideration for time value of money. So there must be disbursement and disbursement for what? Against the consideration for the time value of money. So these are the two essential requirement. If some, some debt does not comply with these two things, then it can't be treated as a financial debt. Okay. Then second part. And includes financial debts means a debt along with interest, if any, which is dispersed against the consideration for time value of money and includes. Huh? So now if this portion is uh, not. Uh, so first portion is exhaustive, which must be complied with. And second is instances that these are the instances. These can be the instances of such uh, 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 financial debt. So these are the examples of financial debt. And uh, this is not exhaustive according to if inclusive word includes words is there. So these are some of the example. There can be other similar kind of uh, uh, transactions which can fall within the ambit of this. Okay. But Supreme Court said when both these terms are, both these words are used. Huh? So where means financial debt means such and such. Huh? So Honorable Supreme Court says that even the ex uh, uh, this one inclusive part they should com comply with this. They should meet this definition. And if they don't, then they will not be treated as a, they will not be treated as financial debt. So the list which is given, if in that list, this requirement is not met, the requirement is disbursement against the consideration for time value of money. So disbursement. In this particular case <coughs> of JP Infra, Disbursement was not made to JP Infra. Disbursement was made to JP Associates. So Honorable Supreme Court in this matter said, because there was no disbursement, so first part of the def definition, first part of the definition is not fulfilled, is not met. So this debt cannot be treated as a financial debt. Uh, so Honorable Supreme Court said that but at the same time, there is a security which is given to those secured creditors. Huh? So if they are holding that security, they will be treated as what? Secured creditor. They will be treated as secured creditor. 
but not the secured financial creditor because they, they don't fulfill this first part of the definition. Huh? So this was the main ratio of this judgment. Though uh, you know that the transaction of creating debt, uh, transaction of creating mortgage was declared as a preferential transaction. So which was set aside. So if mortgage is set aside, and that was to the extent of 758 acres, that means for 100 acres, they could still be treated as secured creditor, not secured financial creditor. But with respect to 758 acres, they were not to be treated as either financial creditor or non-financial creditor. Okay, so though second subsequent part was this uh, second issue was relevant only to the extent of that 100 acres of land. Uh, which had been created prior to this last two years period. And uh, so to that extent, these creditors would have been treated as secured creditor and not the secured financial creditor. Okay, so let's see what are the findings. Huh? So I have explained to you actually as, as to what this judgment was. But, and another important uh, the thing I want to uh, tell you, I think most of us must be aware of the same, that in a particular judgment, uh, there are two portions. One is ratio decidendi, uh, and second is obiter dicta. So ratio decidendi is the main part, the principles which are laid down. And obiter dicta are other observations. Uh, so normally in a particular judgment, the ratio decidendi, the ratio portion, applies to future judgments that is to be followed that is mandatory for the lower courts to follow okay and but obiter dicta is not obiter dicta you can use for the purpose of interpretation but that is not the binding part if in a supreme court judgment a number of things have been said but we have to see what is the ratio and what is the what is the meaning of ratio on the basic principles which are deciding a particular issue and uh, you, another thing you know that our courts, they don't decide hypothetical questions. Hypothetical questions, you say, sir, this law, there is a difficulty of interpretation. So can somebody go to Supreme Court, Ki, sir, kindly interpret it? Answer is no. When there is a real life dispute, then only Supreme Court or any other court can uh, decide a question. Okay. And a reason for the same is that when there is a uh, there is a uh, proceedings before a court, there must be two parties, so that both of them, one is they, they have to defend their uh, 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 whatever arguments they are taking. Uh, so two rival parties have to be there, and they have to argue their cases. Uh, so both of them they are making their efforts, and then based on the same, a particular court decides uh, that issue. So that is, that is, uh, uh, so there must be two parties who are arguing that matter and then only there is a judgment and then only there is an issue. Uh, so if there is no, if there is no issue before a Supreme Court, suppose in this particular matter, uh, these two issues were there, but suppose there is some other issue which came, which came for discussion and the Supreme Court has expressed its view on the same, but that is not the ratio of the judgment. Ratio is only those issues which have been argued, which was which are before the Supreme Court and which have been on which the Supreme Court has given its judgment, has laid down the principles as to why a particular uh, 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 issue should be decided in a particular manner. So the argument which is there, the argument or the justification which has been given, that is the ratio of a particular judgment. So in this particular case, so as I told you that 5-8 interpretation, I have not seen this interpretation in any other matter uh, of section 5-8 by the Supreme Court. So I think this is the only judgment which interprets uh, the term financial creditors. Okay, so though uh, up now, uh, now consider this definition. If suppose there is a guarantee Suppose uh, this particular entity, uh, our CD, it gives a guarantee for the debts of uh, its sister concern. Okay, so then debt is raised by the sister concern. Debt is raised by the sister concern. 
money has not been dispersed to this corporate debtor. Money is dispersed to the other company, sister concern. So where this definition, first part of the definition, that is not met. So whether in, in the case of a in the case of a uh, CD where it has given the guarantee for the debt of for securing the debt of another company, whether the that particular guarantee holder bank should be treated as a financial creditor. Based on this judgment, the answer is no. Uh, so based on this judgment, because there is no disbursement which has been made uh, to the corporate debtor, then it will not be treated as a this one, though the people, some of the people, they say that guarantees are included in inclusive portion of Section 58. But Honorable Supreme Court says that inclusive portion also should meet this part of the definition, first part of the definition, that there should be a disbursement for the time value of money, for consideration for the time value of money. So which is not there. So I think that issue also needs to be decided, though I am having some other judgment of Honorable Supreme Court, where they have proceeded on the basis that a guarantee holder bank can file an application under Section 7. But that is not the ratio of that judgment. Supreme Court has not considered in that particular matter whether a guarantee holder bank should be treated as a financial creditor. So that is not the question. There in that matter, Honorable Supreme Court, uh, because this issue was not there before Honorable Supreme Court, nobody raised that issue. Uh, so Honorable Supreme Court has proceeded on the basis that the, the uh, financial creditor guarantee holder bank, guarantee holder bank is a financial creditor. On that basis, Honorable Supreme Court has proceeded. But that does not mean that in all the cases, we will be treating guarantee holders banks as or any guarantee holder as a financial creditor. Reason is that uh, this particular definition is not complied with. So let's see. Looking to the frame of the code where the uh, financial debt have been defined with the word means and includes, we may further refer to the principle of construction of such a definition clause in a statute. Thusly put, the law remains settled that where a word is defined to mean something, the definition is prima facie restrictive and exhaustive. So where the word mean is there, so that definition is exhaustive, that is restrictive. If something, if something does not fall within the definition, that cannot be treated as falling within the definition. On the other hand, where the word defined is declared to include something more, the definition is prima facie extensive. So where the word include is there, then that means other transaction can also fall within the ambit. Then, Applying the aforesaid fundamental principle, uh, uh, we don't have any iota of doubt that if for a debt to become financial debt, for the purpose of part two of the code, the basic elements are that it ought to be dispersed against the consideration for time value of money. It may include any of the methods for raising money or incurring liability by the modes prescribed in subsection A to F of section 5A. It may also include any derivative transaction or counter indemnity obligation as per clause G and H of section 5A. And it may also be the amount of any liability in respect of the guarantee or indemnity for any of the items referred to in subclauses A to H. The requirement of existence of a debt, which is dispersed against the consideration for time value of money, in our view, remains an essential part, even in respect of any of the transactions stated in subclauses A to I of section 58, even if it is not necessarily stated therein. So kindly see the meaning of this word. Uh, meaning of this particular uh, thing which has been stated by Honorable Supreme Court. Honorable Supreme Court says even in respect in the transactions which are falling in subclauses A to H, you must see that there is a disbursement for the consideration for time value of money. If that consideration is not there, if that consideration, if that uh, element is not there, then debt cannot be treated as a financial debt, even if it is falling under clauses A to H of section 5, 8. Okay, uh, so five eight even in case of including inclusive person, Supreme Court says requirement of existence of a debt which is dispersed against the consideration for the time value of money, in our view, remains an essential part in respect of any of the transactions or dealing stated in sub clauses A to I of section five eight, even if it is not necessarily stated therein. So this is very very important part of the judgment. 
Uh, so most of the cases what we are doing is that if that is file falling, if something is falling within these uh, clauses A to I of section 5, we say that these, this, this will be treated as a financial debt only. No, in all those cases, you must see that money is dispersed to the to the corporate uh, debtor. The money is dispersed to the corporate debtor. In, in, in this particular case of JP Infra and JP Associates also, uh, you will see that money was dispersed, but not to the corporate debtor. So it is not that in that transaction money dispersal is not there. And uh, that is also to uh, 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 pay, uh, interest is also uh, payable on that amount. But by whom? By another company, not by this company. So GIL, which is the corporate debtor, that corporate debtor has not received the disbursement. The disbur disbursement is received by a third party. Uh, so that is the reason that the, the creditors of the third party, they have not been treated as financial creditor because they just did not disperse this money to the corporate debtor. Then in any case, uh, the definition by its very frame cannot be read so expensive, rather infinitely wide that the root requirement of disbursement against the consideration for the time value of money could be forsaken in the manner that any transaction could stand alone to become a financial debt. So this definition cannot be ignored. In other words, any of the transactions stated in the set sub clauses A to I of section 5A would be falling within the ambit of financial debt only if it carries the essential elements stated in the principal clause, or at least has the features which could be traced to such essential elements in the principal clause or principal clauses that definition with the words means huh? in yet other words the essential element of dispersal and that too against the consideration for time value of money needs to be found in the genesis of any debt before it may be treated as financial debt within the meaning of section 58 of the code so any debt you consider but the dispersal and that too against consideration for time value of money must be there. This debt may be of any nature, but a part of it always required to be carrying or corresponding to, or at least having some traces of dispersal against consideration for the time value of money. Then the root requirement, I think we can skip that we are having. I think this judgment is a very lengthy judgment. I think we can't. Uh, uh, cover it uh, fully within within this one year's uh, one hour's time period. Then uh, every secured creditor would be a creditor, and every financial creditor would also be a creditor. But every secured creditor may not be a financial creditor. So the Nobel Supreme Court said that uh, those secured those creditor they are holding the security of this company, so they will be treated as secured creditor of this company, but they will not be treated as secured financial creditor. So that difference is there. Therefore, we have no hesitation in saying that a person having only security interest over the assets of the corporate debtor, like the instant third party securities, even if falling within the description of secured creditor by virtue of collateral security extended by the corporate debtor would nevertheless stand outside the sect of financial creditor as per the definition contained in subsection 7 and 8 of section 5 of the code. Differently put, if a CD has given its property in mortgage to secure the debt of a third party, it may lead to mortgage debt and therefore it may fall within the definition of debt under section 310 of the code. However, it would remain a debt alone and cannot partake the character of a financial debt within the meaning of section 58 of the code. So if you have CD has given the security, huh? Then in that case, uh, security of its asset, then the creditor will be treated as a secured creditor, but not the secured financial creditor, unless that first part of the definition is complied with. Then uh, we are left with five minutes only, I think. Huh. Submission on second issue. For what I think we, we will not be able to consider the part, uh, first uh, issue, though I have already told you, and again, I will, I will uh, very quickly, I will tell you what were the uh, arguments. And uh, so for what has been discussed I didn't know, on the issue as to whether lenders of JL could be treated as financial creditor, we hold that such lenders of JL on the strength of mortgages in question may fall in the category of secured creditor 
but such mortgages being neither towards any loan facility or advance to the corporate debtor, nor towards protecting any facility or security of the corporate debtor, it cannot be said that the CD owes them any financial debt within the meaning of Section 508, and hence such lenders of JL don't fall in the category of financial creditors of corporate debtor JL. So this was the final uh, issue. Uh, then I think let's go back quickly. If we have some time, let's. I think uh, let me let me tell you as to what to uh, what were the arguments with respect to that. One is mortgage created in favor of the lenders of JEL and not the creditors of JIL. So section forty three will not be attracted. So if you see section forty three, huh? so section forty three says that this preferential transaction should be in favor of what? In favor of the creditors. Let me read. A corporate debtor shall be deemed to have given a preference if there is a transfer of property or an interest thereat, thereof of the CD for the benefit of a creditor or a CRT or a guarantor for or on account of an antecedent financial debt or operational debt or other liabilities owed by the corporate debtor. So the argument which was made was that these the benefit, this security has not been created in favor of the creditor of the CD. They said that these ICE, these bankers, they are they were not the creditors of uh, CD. They were the creditors of JL. So actually, the definition is not met. Section forty three requirement is not met. Uh, so honorable Supreme Court in that matter said that because there was there was a debt, there was a debt relating to this one, uh, which was payable to the uh, to the creditor, uh, payable to JAL. JL was a creditor of uh, GIL and it was the mortgage was not created in to benefit the financial creditor. It was created created for giving benefit to JEL and JEL was all, 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 uh, already a creditor of GIL. Uh, so this was one argument. Then I see the tr uh, transaction prior to 1-12-2016 could not be considered. So that issue was also decided by Honorable Supreme Court that uh, the law specifically provided that uh, the transaction uh, uh, prior to 1-12-2016, because they said when this act was notified, uh, so two years transactions uh, in the respect of related party could be considered as uh, a preferential transaction or undervalued transaction. So, uh, so the Supreme Court said that law pro clearly provides that uh, it will have it will be having retrospective effect. Uh, so this question, was, this argument was also not considered. And uh, another important thing, another issue was that uh, the mortgages were not created during last uh, two years for the first time. So these mortgages, I think five, six years back, or even prior to that, these mortgages were being created in favor of these lenders. So for, for example, for a period of three years, huh? and at the expiry of three years, fresh mortgages were created. So like that mortgages were created. So RP, IRP, he considered the mortgages which were created during last two years preceding the ICD. So bank, the argument was that because these are not new, these are being uh, carried forward for the last many years, but Supreme Court said, no, these are new transactions. Prior, the earlier mortgages were will be treated as redeemed on that day or will be treated as closed on that day. And then fresh agreement is entered into for creation of further mortgage. So it will be treated as if the new mortgage has been created. So these transaction will also be treated as falling within the, uh, within the last two years preceding LCD. So I think with this, we can uh, close today's session. If you have any question, we can, I think, quickly consider that. Or otherwise, I will share this uh, PPT. It's a very lengthy PPT. I think you will, I think you must read it. You must read it uh, so that you come to know about the principles based on which this judgment, uh, these two particular issues were decided by Honorable Supreme Court. Your, sir, your PPT is more than, I think, 100 pages. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And more than.
100 slides are there 100 Correct. slides yeah. yes yes so i can share it with you you can Please go through share, sir. okay right uh, anu shall we so we close this hmm? um yes if there are any questions uh, you may ask Oh, okay, so thank you so much, sir, for taking up the session and it was very helpful. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, all. Mm, the next session will be taken by Mr. Ashish Makija. Mr. Ashish Makija is a managing attorney of AMC Law Firm. He is a chartered accountant, cost accountant and an advocate. He has over 33 years of hands-on experience on commercial, corporate and allied laws. He also holds a master's degree in law from India and USA. He is a professor at Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs. He was a professor at Thomas Jefferson School of Law, San Diego, USA until December 2014. He has published several books and research, research papers to his credit. He is one of the specialist editors of the 23rd edition of MC Bhandari's Guide to Company Law Procedures published by LexisNexis in 2016. Sir, you may please start the session. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, friends, may I request uh, everyone to uh, just mute your uh, audio if possible because background noises are not a good thing. So, whenever you need to ask a question, probably you can open your audios also. So, friends, uh, a very good afternoon to everyone. <clears throat> I think I was listening to Nilesh ji uh, and important judgment of uh, JP, he was considering that. And it's a very relevant judgment on the aspect of uh, the, the avoidance transactions particularly. Uh, friends, may I request one thing? I see that there are almost around 50 participants, but only five, six, seven have opened their videos. So is it possible that everyone can open their videos so that I can see all these smiling faces and I can interact? I don't want to speak to blank screens, okay? I don't have too much of a presentation. I will just take you to the important parts of the judgments. So yeah, now, now it seems that some people have opened their videos. Thank you. Oh, some are traveling in car also. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> it's important that learning should go on. That's that's very important. Okay. So, friends, a very good afternoon to everyone once again. And uh, in fact, uh, this is these sessions. Uh, we, uh, may I request everyone to just please mute their audios once again? Some background noises are coming. Okay. Thank you. Uh, friends, I was mentioning that insofar as the jurisprudence is concerned. Now, the Supreme Court judgments definitely lay down the law. And Supreme Court judgments are required to be followed to the core, not only by the RPs, but also by the adjudicating authorities and the, the uh, appellate authorities. And now, of course, the trend has little slowed down, but if you look at the Previous judgments, say, in 2016, 17, 18, 19 also, the more than 90% of the judgments of NCL 80 were overturned by the Honorable Supreme Court. So, therefore, the jurisprudence gets finality when Supreme Court decides the matters. And on IBC particularly, there have been a lot of judgments. I think it's sometimes it also becomes very difficult to keep a track. And for that purpose, I must congratulate ICSI, uh, IPI, uh, because they have done a wonderful job in the sense that uh, they have conducted these kind of programs for the purposes of updation on the Supreme Court judgments. And uh, I was uh, in a lighter way and I was talking to them that you always call it as a final word on IBC. So how many final words would be there? So anyway, I was told that this is the final, final version today of final uh, word on IBC. In fact, I'm, I'm so glad that the first, uh, you can say, the seminar on final word was also, I was also invited in that. So I was the opening batsman and probably I'm the tail ender also. Okay, so friends, now let's get down to the business. There are two judgments uh, which I am proposing to discuss today. And both of them are extremely important. So we'll, we'll understand the background of the facts and we will also go into the law. And then we will try to analyze. It's not what the Supreme Court has analyzed is important. I think we must also analyze that. The first judgment which I propose to take is the 
Tata Consultancy versus Vishal Ghisulal Jain. Now, this is a very, very important judgment. And what happened in this particular case? Now, friends, once the CIRP starts, all of us are aware that moratorium kicks in. Now, if moratorium kicks in, and if there is a contract, now the issue, the most important issue in this particular judgment is, if there is a contract between the corporate debtor and a third party, can that contract be terminated by the third party during CIRP? Now, that's the big question, whether the moratorium will, will apply to that extent or not. Let's go back to, uh, you see, section 14, where it talks about the moratorium. Now, that's extremely important. Let us look at what it proposes. Section 14 moratorium, we all know section 14, one talks about these prohibitions. Uh, which which are to be implemented, which are which are directed by uh, the adjudicating authority, which prohibits uh, the institution of the suits in clause number A. In clause number B, it also prohibits transfer or encumbrance or alienation or disposing of uh, the the uh, any of the assets of the corporate debtors or the legal rights or beneficial interests which are therein. And third, it debars any action to foreclose or recover or uh, enforce any security interest like surfacing. The last one is extremely important, 14.1d, where it also prohibits recovery of any property by the lessor during the CIRP, if that property is occupied or in possession of the corporate debtor. The reasons are very simple, that look, as an IRP or RP, you are doing something which is work in progress. You are trying to resolve the company, insolvency of the company. Now. If during this period, certain actions do take place, which affect the going concern concept of the company, what is the point? Then the, the insolvency resolution will not be possible. We all know that, right? So this is, this is extremely important. In fact, if you look at the explanation which was added, now that's very important explanation. I'd let me read it for you, which is given under section 14.1. It says, for the purpose of this subsection, it is clarified that notwithstanding anything contained in any other law for the time being in force. So whatever law may say, other law may say, uh, any uh, uh, a license, a permit, registration, quota, concessions, clearances, or a similar grant or right given by the central government, state government, or any other regulator, etc., et shall not be suspended or terminated on the ground of insolvency. Underline this word, friends, on the ground of insolvency. And of course, it talks about subject to the condition that there is no default in payment of the current dues arising from the use or continuation of the license or permit registration quota. Now, this was primarily on a sectoral grounds, like supposing a corporate debtor has got mining rights given by the government. They have got telecom rights. They have got any kind of rights could be there. So now, in the, because the main business of the company might be dependent upon that license. Like, let us take the case of an example of, say, a company like Airtel. Now, Airtel runs on licenses by the government. Now, supposing, uh, God forbid, if Airtel comes into insolvency, uh, then uh, the, and the try, it revokes those licenses or the government revokes those licenses, then you see the going consent concept of the Airtel will go away. Obviously, it will not be able to survive. What RP is going to do when the license on the basis of which the company is running its business so is not there. So let us understand one of the important things that it forms part of the core business of the company. And then merely on the ground of insolvency. Now, that's very important. So now the question that arises is that whether a contract can be terminated, A, which, is, which does not form part of the core of the business, core business of the co corporate debtor, number one. Number two, and whether it can be terminated on any other ground other than ground of insolvency. So once the co corporate debtor comes into insolvency, nobody can take a plea that, look, you have come into insolvency there and my contract provides that one moment the company comes into insolvency, I can terminate the contract. Naturally, in some contracts, if you look at commercial contracts, there is definitely a clause which says that if the company goes into insolvency, then the contract may be automatically terminated or 
the, the party has got a right to terminate after giving certain notice. So these are the important aspects. Now, this particular explanation, which was added, uh, this was added with effect from 2020. Why it was added? Because of, uh, you see, a judgment, which every I think most of you are aware, Gujarat Urja, that judgment was there versus Amit Gupta. This is 2021, 7 SCC 209. Now, what happened in this? The company had an agreement uh, with, with Gujarat government which is called as PPA. So they had granted certain rights. And the moment the, C the company came into CIRP, then the Gujarat government terminated that contract. So RP went to NCLT, and ultimately the matter reached the doorstep of the Supreme Court. And Supreme Court said that during the CIRP, such contracts, which form the basis of the uh, existence of the company, this forms the core business of the company, and only on account of insolvency, the contracts cannot be terminated. And therefore, after that, the government also realized that this is happening and therefore they added the explanation under section 14.1. This was only the impact of the Gujarat Urja judgment. Now, the uh, other aspect, which is also very important, in Tata Consultancy, what was the issue? The company, which was uh, the, the corporate debtor, had entered into an agreement or what we call it as facilities agreement to, with Tata Consultancy. So here, the premises was being provided uh, by the, uh, uh, the facilities were being provided by the corporate debtor. And the facilities were being used by Tata Consultancy. So the supplier of facilities was the corporate debtor and Tata Consultancy was the consumer. So, uh, and prior to, you see, CIRP, when the company came into CIRP, prior to that, the uh, Tata Consultancy had exchanged some communications saying that your services are deficient, you are not doing this, and a lot of communication was there. It was not only one communication, there were three, four communications which were there. And they, uh, the company came into CIRP. Now, the important fact is, company came into CIRP in March 2019. The exact date is 29th March. Tata Consultancy Services issued a termination notice on 10th June 2019 after the CIRP commenced. But obviously, they took view that, look, we have already communicated because you are deficient in services. You are not providing this. You are not providing that. So they actually relied upon the previous communications, but terminated after the CIRP started. Naturally, the RP went to uh, the, the uh, NCLT saying that uh, this cannot be done during the CIRP. The NCLT said that, look, this issue needs examination. So they gave a stay. They said till the time CIRP is going on or till the time we decide this application, they will not terminate the contract. And uh, this was challenged before NCLAT. NCLAT, only the stay order. Right now, there was no final judgment, but there was only a stay order which was given. The stay order was challenged before the NCLAT and NCLAT upheld the, the stay order which was passed by NCLT. They said, look, if you do this, then uh, the, the company will not be able to survive. So uh, therefore, during the pendency of the CIRP, such contracts should not be terminated. You should wait for a certain period. So these were the issues uh, uh, which were there. Now data consultancy went to Supreme Court. Now in Supreme Court, they took three, four arguments. What were the what was their first argument? Number one, that section 14 in this case does not apply. And in fact, uh, I will draw your attention to section 14, subsection 2, which talks about what? The supply of essential goods or services shall not be terminated or suspended during the moratorium period. Now, this was also an important section. But essential goods or services, as we know, they have been defined in uh, CIRP regulations in a very different manner. So they said, look, number one, the supplier is the corporate debtor. Supplier is not the TCS, Tata Consultancy. I am the consumer. So therefore, section 14.2 does not apply. 
because it talks about supply of goods or services to the corporate debtor and not by the corporate debtor. <laughs> Look at the interpretation. Okay, so they said we are outside this section 14.2. Here, TCS is availing services from the corporate debtor. It is not the other way around. Second, we have issued a termination notice, not only because of the CIRP, because the company has come into insolvency, but because there have been deficiency of services even in the past, and there are a lot of communications regarding that. And third, they also challenge now, which is very important, friends, section 60, subsection 5, clause number C. I think my friends are aware that this section talks about what? This section particularly talks about the powers, the residuary powers. If, in fact, this is one of the important sections. And uh, I used to say in a lot of seminars that if you are not able to find any section under which you can approach NCLT, use 65C. So that is the most important section, 65 rather, 60 subsection 5, right? Isn't it? Because it's it, it starts with a non obstant clause. It says, Notwithstanding anything to the contrary uh, contained in any other law for the time being, NCLT shall have the jurisdiction to entertain or dispose of. And then there are three clauses which are mentioned. It talks about any application or proceeding by or against the corporate debtor, any claim which is made by or against the corporate debtor. And last is most important, any question of priority, any question of law or facts. Underline the word, friends, this is a very important thing. Any question of law or facts, which is arising out of or in relation to the insolvency or liquidation of the corporate debtor. So 65C is a residuary power and which is typically used in most of the applications. We know that primarily if you were to go for extension of time, you file under 12. If you have to go for, uh, say, uh, cooperation of the directors, suspended directors, you go under 19. You have to go for approval of the plan. You go under section 30, subsection 4, 6. Now, if there is no other section and you want to file an application, where do you file? 60, subsection 5. Typically, that is filed. Even for the claim rejection, people come here. And any question of priority, any question of law or facts, but it should be relating to insolvency. Now, that is very important. So, they are, therefore, their third argument was that the NCLT has exercised powers under 65C, which is a residuary power, but they cannot, you see, come into the commercial contracts. Now, if their jurisdiction under IBC does not extend to decide on the commercial contracts, because if we look at 65C, which is which very clearly says, question of priority or any question of law or facts, what is that arising out of or in relation to? Now, these are very important words. Insolvency resolution or liquidation proceedings. So this is, in fact, was very important center. So this was their third argument that NCLT has exceeded jurisdiction. So these are the three grounds. Let me repeat. Number one, they said we are not covered under section 14 because we are the suppliers and we are not the recipient of the services. Number two, the termination of the contract has happened not because of CIRP or the company coming into insolvency, but it is because of the commercial, uh, uh, you see, you can say issues which were there, a deficiency in surveys or not providing the services. And third, the NCLT, when they have uh, uh, used their power, that residuary power, it is exceeding those residuary powers because NCLT does not have power to entertain such kind of termination of contracts. So these were the three grounds. Now the Supreme Court ultimately, of course, had to decide. So Supreme Court uh, was now deciding two issues. Number one, whether the NCLT can exercise its residuary jurisdiction under 65C to adjudicate upon the contractual dispute between the parties. And then it was second question was related to it that Assuming they can exercise their residuary jurisdiction, can they impose and stay at interim stay, interim stay on the termination of the facilities agreement? That was, of course, a factual question which was required to be answered. So primarily, these two issues were there. Naturally, the uh, person who was arguing on 
you see, in favor of the uh, NCLT, that is the RP, of course, their arguments were that, look, it is uh, motivated by the insolvency and uh, the, this contract is an essential contract and NCLT has exercised its correct jurisdiction and they relied upon Gujarat Urja. So friends, I'm coming back again and again on Gujarat Urja because in Gujarat Urja, the Supreme Court also considered 65C and they wrote very elaborately that yes, 65C, NCLT can also uh, give a stay or also can say that you will not terminate that essential contract during the CIRP. But they made a distinction in this judgment. They said, look, our judgment, Gujarat Urja judgment should be read in the context of the facts of the case. And I think my friends are aware that in uh, any judgment, we must read the, uh, the text and the context must match. This is extremely important. So every judgment turns on its own facts. They said there the facts were that A, that was an essential contract. B, the, the, the existence of the corporate data depended upon that contract. C, the contract was sought to be terminated on the ground of insolvency alone by Gujarat government. So those three facts must be considered in Gujarat Urja and those three facts, whether they are applicable here or not, we'll have to see this. So ultimately, Supreme Court, uh, obviously there is an elaborate discussion. I'm not going to take you to those elaborate. Number one, they looked at Section 238. That uh, 238 says that NCLT's jurisdiction can be invoked, right? And in fact, in Gujarat Urja, this is the sentence. They say NCLT's jurisdiction could be invoked in the present case because the termination of the PPA was sought solely on the ground that the corporate debtor has, is now subject to insolvency resolution process under IBC. So that was the ultimate uh, you see, judgment in Gujarat Urcha. Now the question was whether NCLT can exercise their jurisdiction. So the Supreme Court wrote in this judgment that look, it is pertinent to mention. In fact, in Gujarat Urja also they wrote that NCLT cannot exercise its jurisdiction on the matters which dehorse the insolvency proceedings because such matters would fall outside the realm of the IBC. So this is what exactly they had mentioned even in that time also. And, uh, uh, and because in Gujarat Urja, the termination was based on a, some clause which said that the moment the company comes into insolvency, they have a right to terminate. Here, in the present case, Supreme Court said that, number one, the contract was not terminated on a, on the, solely on the ground of insolvency, number one. Number two, it is not an essential contract because it is only a part of a facilities agreement. In fact, this facility, the agreement is are being provided by the corporate debtor. They are not being uh, provided by the, uh, the the data consultancy. So therefore, if we read very carefully section 14.2, it does not fall even under that. Even if we treat it as an essential, it will not fall under this. Because it only talks about supplier or supply of goods or services to the corporate debtor. And then... In the last, you see the Supreme Court actually audit, added a caution. They said, look, we would like to issue a note of caution to NCLT and NCLAT. What was that caution? They said, NCLT and NCLAT should not interfere with the party's contractual right to terminate a contract. So this is very, very important. They say, look, uh, even if the dispute arises in relation to insolvency, a party can be restrained. So they say restraint is possible from termination of the contract only if it is central to the success of the CIRP. Underline these words, friends. If it is central to the success of the CIRP. Which was very important in Gujarat Urja's case because otherwise it would have resulted in the corporate death of the corporate debtor. But in this case, they said this is not central to the success of the CIRP. So therefore, NCLTs should not interfere into the uh, this kind of powers. So 65C should be used, but it should be used sparingly and based on the facts of the case. So this was the, the whole judgment all about where they distinguish themselves also from Gujarat Urja.
Now, what are the takeaways, friends? The takeaways, as I always say, that even if, you see, what happens many a times, we say that, oh, Supreme Court uh, uh, said that Gujarat government cannot terminate this contract. So, therefore, no contract can be terminated. Now, this is not always the case. That is why I always insist that let us read the case. Let us look at the ratio of the case. Let us look at the reasoning which has been given by the Supreme Court. Even in that judgment also, Supreme Court said, this contract is central to the success of the CIRP. So therefore, it cannot be terminated. And therefore, NCLT has powers under 65C to give a stay. But if the contract is not central to the success of the CIRP, then NCLTs cannot interfere into the contractual termination of the contract. So now the jurisprudence is, has been established in this manner. So friends, let us read these judgments very carefully and on the uh, issues which are involved there. And we must match the text and context. And then let us not form a general opinion that once a judgment comes, it is applicable in all cases. No, that is not there. So everyone can distinguish those judgments. And here I must compliment. In fact, uh, companies like Tata's only can approach the Supreme Court even on an interim stay, isn't it? I mean, a normal person will not be in a position to, uh, a normal contractor will not be in a position to challenge before NCLAT and then go to the Supreme Court. So even at the interim stage, they took the matter to the Supreme Court and then they got this uh, fantastic judgment, which is a kind of a landmark judgment now. Now, friends, uh, any any question on this, on uh, Section 14 and the uh, powers of the NCLT 65C, or if you have faced any such situation, uh, what has been your uh, take on that? And if you have experienced anything, I think if you can share with other participants, that would be wonderful. Anyone who would like can to contribute on this? So, uh, I have a question. Uh, yes, can, uh, can the NCLT has power a contempt of court because if, if the NCLT has passed the order under 65 regarding right. non-corporation and non-corporation right. still continues, then right. again we have approach to the NCLT that uh, the corporate data is not cooperating. Then right. uh, again, uh, NCLT has given the direction. Right. And for the third time, if uh, uh, he is not owing the order, then whether NCLT has got power to sue order of uh, contempt of court. Okay. Anilaji, a wonderful question. I don't know whether you are also entitled to ask a question because you are, a, you can say, a co-panelist or co-faculty. But anyhow, uh, be that as it may, this is in a lighter way. Uh, well, friends, I think there's an important question which has been uh, raised by Anilaji whether the NCLTs have got contempt power or not. In fact, this issue arose in one of our cases and it's very interesting. Uh, what happened? There was uh, a lawyer which was involved and uh, during IRP stage, he had done, he had rendered some services. He claimed that he had rendered some services to the corporate debtor and he had raised certain bills. Of course, some bills were not approved by the COC because you know that any expense which is incurred by IRP has to be ratified. So those parts were not done. So when the RP took over and uh, the matter was placed before the COC, COC said, look, uh, we, we are going to reject it. So they rejected. Now, naturally, advocate being an advocate, he approached the NCLT. Now, when I appeared and Justice M.M. Kumar was there, this was a matter of around 2019. Now, Mr. Justice M.M. Kumar mentioned to me, he said, Mr. Makija, I don't want to handle lawyers' issues. The fees of the lawyers, you are also a lawyer. So why don't you, uh, you see, interfere and uh, advise the RP to consider these uh, bills and whatever can be paid, let us let that be paid. I said, yes, my lord, I will also look into this and uh, we, will, we will see whatever best is possible. So when I uh, talked to RP, I said, look, what are the issues? Then it was explained that uh, in one of the cases, he has raised a bill, but it is attendance is not marked. And uh, there is no authority engagement letter in his favor by the IRP. And some bills have been raised, which COC is objecting. I said, okay, do one thing. You make a statement of whatever bills have been paid and whatever bills are pending and place it before the COC once again. Let's let's take the uh, opinion of the COC. COC approved some part, but they said we are not going to approve this. 
So naturally, what part was there? That was paid. The rest was not paid. Now, this person uh, filed a contempt petition against the RP before the NCLT, saying that in the last order, Mr. Mukhija confirmed that these are going to be paid and uh, you see, and the RP is not paying it. Now, I, when I appeared, I told the, the bench that, look, we said whatever is possible will be paid. It was not that we had committed. So therefore, there no contempt does not lie. That is number one. But before we could even argue that point, by that time, Justice M.M. Kumar had gone and some acting president was there. Now, he did not even, I mean, hear the application on merits or whatever. Now, he actually mentioned in the order that NCLT does not have the power to issue contempt. Right? So that was the point which was taken. And then he had taken, uh, you see, uh, recourse to Companies Act, where it said that, look, Companies Act has not been amended to include IBC also insofar as the contempt power of contempt is concerned. This matter went to NCLAT. And NCLAT, when this matter came up, before we could discuss on the facts of the case, because I explained to the judge that, look, these are the facts of the case. The COC has not, he says, Mr. Makija, we are not on the facts of the case. We are only a limited issue, whether NCLTs have got contempt power to issue contempt under IBC or not. That's the only issue. So they also issued a notice to IBBI, the regulator. So regulator also filed a reply or kind of an affidavit, and then the matter was argued. And ultimately, in that judgment, which Nilesh you can also look into that, that is Shalender Singh versus, uh, uh, what was the name of the company? Uh, why I'm forgetting the name of the company. Anyway, it is Shalender Singh versus, okay. Anyway, I'll, I'll recall because I'm handling, uh, you see, on behalf of the RP. They have passed a judgment saying that NCLT is not powerless to issue contempt. So therefore, there is a judgment of NCLAD which clearly says that NCLTs have got power to issue contempt also if their orders are not, uh, you can say, complied with. So friends, what you can, uh, what is the takeaway? The takeaway is that if you obtain an order, if you obtain directions, and if those are not complied with, with by any person, you are not supposed to go back to the NCLT again for again getting a, some kind of an order. Just simply file contempt petition. So contempt petition, if you file, and if you quote that Shalinder Singh judgment, <coughs> that is good enough, friends. And that will be, uh, yeah, the name of the case is Shalinder Singh versus Neil Infrastructure. So I was uh, forgetting the name, Neil Infrastructure. Or in fact, it might be uh, Shalinder Singh versus Nisha Malpani because and probably the RP was the uh, first respondent in that case. So just search that judgment where it has been clearly laid down that NCLTs have got powers to issue contempt. I hope Niloshji, that is, I'm, I'm clear on this now. <laughs> okay. sir, uh, sir, there is uh, one, uh, I think, communication from IBBI also, which right. says that the insolvency professionals are the officers of the court and anyone not cooperating with them will be treated as contempt of court. Uh, you see, that is all right, but at the end of the day, you see, IBBI can issue any number of circulars. That is not a problem, but we have to understand one thing that this circular should also be within the four corners of the law, isn't it? Like you remember that one, one uh, circular was issued by a principal bench uh, of NCLT during, I believe it was uh, issued in July 2020 during the COVID period that all applications under Section 7 must attach a certificate of default from the information utility. Yes, they made it yes. mandatory. They made it mandatory. And they said even the applications which are already filed and pending, they must also attach, otherwise their applications will be dismissed. So on two fronts. Now this circular was challenged before the Calcutta High Court. And the, the name of the judgment is Uni Value Research, right? Uni Value Research. Now, what what uh, you see, two people, in fact, two parties challenged, and they were disposed of by a common order by Calcutta High Court. In the first case, the person said, "Look, my application was complete and ready. 
and suddenly the circular has come. I don't have a certificate of default from the information utility. So this cannot be made applicable to me. And this is violative under which law they have issued this circular. The second one said, my application is already pending, already filed. And suddenly the circular has come. They say, we will dismiss your application. He said, how is this possible? Even if assuming the circular is right, it is applicable prospectively and not retrospectively. So these were the two uh, on uh, two applications which went before, two writ petitions went before the Calcutta High Court. And Calcutta High Court, interestingly, friends, and I have mentioned in a few of the, my seminars also, they applied pure Kelson's uh, th theory of, uh, th uh, you see, pure theory of law by the by the jurist Kelson, Kelson's pure theory of law. I don't know how many have read jurisprudence, but please read that theory. Kelson's pure theory of law says that there is a hierarchy. And what and there is on the top there is a grand norm. What is the grand norm? Grand norm is the basic norm, right? He was a German jurist, so therefore he used that word grand norm. Grand norm actually means the basic norm. Now, basic norm means that all other laws flow from a certain basic norm. So in India, the grand norm is the constitution. And underneath there will be laws. And underneath the laws will be the rules and regulations. So rules and regulations cannot be contradicting the law. And if they do contradict, then they have to give way. Law is supreme. And all laws must comply with the constitution of uh, India. If they contain any provision which is unconstitutional, they will give way. So that is why the challenge is, is relating to the unconstitutionality of laws. Now, the judge actually was wanting to understand that this circular issued by uh, the principal bench was issued and it falls under which, which, which uh, hierarchy. So he said, I looked at NCLT rules and I can't find any power of the principal bench or the president to issue any kind of a circular. But he says, I presume that this circular has been issued under Rule, ele rule 11 of the NCLT rules. And I think my friends are aware what is rule 11 of NCLT rules. It is inherent power, isn't it? In the interest of justice, NCLT can pass any order. That is inherent power. So he said, I am presuming that NCLT has exercised its right under rule 11. Now the question is that under the hierarchy where this circular or notice will fall. So he said that this circular cannot violate the provisions of law. And section 7, he looked at section 7, subsection 3, and he said it gives an option to the applicant either to attach the evidence of default by way of information utility certificate or any other evidence. The word used in section 7 is or. So he said if the lawmakers have provided that you can attach either the certificate from the uh, information utility or you can prove it by some other evidence that the default has been committed, then where is the question of that you must submit this. The government counsel, while arguing, he relied upon section 215, 215, right? 215 talks about the information to be provided to information utility. So it says that any person, the opening sentence of 215 is that any person intending to inform then they can inform the information utility about the loan given, taken, and whatever the defaults are committed. Subsection 2 says the financial creditor shall, the word is shall. And subsection 2 says an operational creditor may. So the government council relied upon the word shall, which is appearing in 215.2. They says this is a legal requirement. All financial creditors are supposed to inform the information utility. So if the NCLT is saying attach the evidence of default, then what is the problem? So this is all right. Then, so, then the high court analyzed 215 subsection 1, read with subsection 2. What did they say? They said that, look, 215 2 cannot be read alone. It has to be read in conjunction with 215 1. And 215 1 very clearly says that any person intending so that gives an option. So it is not mandatory. It is directory in nature. So therefore, 215.2 has to be read first in terms of, uh, you see, subsection 1. Because it says any person who intends to submit 
He says, if I don't want to, don't intend to submit, then you can't force me. So therefore, I could say that 215 is directory and not mandatory in nature. And now with a circular, the NCLTs are making it mandatory. So this has to go away. This, this has to be quashed. So they quash that. So Mahesh why I gave that example, because IBBI may issue any circulars, but ultimately they have to test the, uh, the, the, the uh, you can say, no. uh, on, on it has to be tested on the touchstone of the law, the legal provisions. So I, IBBI you. may say you are an officer. In fact, the NCLTs also say you are an officer of the court. So definitely, if you are an officer of the court, somebody has to comply. But if they don't comply, obviously you'll have to move an application. So straight away, contempt cannot be filed, right? But once the order of the NCLT is there and it is not complied, then the contempt lies. Contempt is there. And it's, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Okay. So friends, any other question or any other uh, uh, feedback, discussion, any comment? So that before we move to the second uh, judgment, which is also very, very important judgment. Okay. Let us go to the second judgment, friends, which is extremely important. It is EBIC Singapore Private Limited and others versus committee of creditors of EduComp. Now, this is this is the judgment. Now, this judgment, my dear friends, in fact, in this, uh, there are three, uh, you can say, civil appeals which has been disposed of by the common order. Not only of EduComp, but uh, there were other uh, civil appeals also relating to, uh, one was for the Aston Field and another was for Arya Filament. There were three corporate debtors. But the issue was quite similar in all the three uh, civil appeals. And the issue was what? Can a resolution applicant, after filing the resolution plan, and after it has been approved by the COC, can he withdraw that resolution plan while it is pending before the adjudicating authority? So now that, has, that, that was the question which was there. Before I give you the facts of the case, friends, or let me give you the facts first and then we will try to discuss before I give you what the Supreme Court decided. Now, Educom, let's take the case of Educom. In May 2017, Educom itself filed a Section 10 application. And on 30th of May 2017, remember that year, 2017, this company came into CIRP. CIRP order was passed. Within one month, the COC was constituted and then period was extended from time to time and the last date was 24th of February 2018. Now, EBICS Singapore was one of the resolution applicants. So, in fact, many people expressed, uh, you can say, expression of interest was filed, but ultimately two parties filed the plan and EBICS was treated as the successful resolution applicant because their plan was approved somewhere in uh, February 2018, I think 21st February to be exact, with almost around 74.16% majority. Now, these are facts which are very unique. And at that time, my friends will recall, prior to the amendment on 6-6-2018, you required 75% approval of the COC. So it was passed by 74.16%. So it was less than 75. But one of the financial creditors who was holding around 1.19% wrote an email to the uh, RP later on saying that uh, they, they because of some technical issue, they could not vote. And therefore, they are voting in favor of the plan. So therefore, the voting percentage now became 75.35%. So this was also one of the ground which was taken in appeal. So therefore, it is a relevant fact. So earlier it was approved by 74.16. But if we add 1.19, so it became 75.35. So this was the issue. Now, on uh, 2nd July 2018, EBICS was, was kind of uh, became edgy. And they issued a letter to the RP or to the COC members also saying that, look, in my uh, UC plan, I had mentioned that the term of the resolution plan is six months. 
and time is the essence under IBC. Now six months have expired and my uh, this is not being approved. So I'll have to reevaluate the resolution plan. Now this is an important question, I think from a perspective of the uh, resolution applicants. So they issued a letter. And then since uh, you know that resolution plan matters, you see they also drag on nowadays. So on 5th July, 2019, frustrated by the delays, now EBIX filed an application before the NCLT. They said, we would like to withdraw the resolution plan. And that is typically known as their first withdrawal application because there were three applications which were filed. Now, what was the ground? First, they said delay. Time is the essence of IBC. You are not approving it. So the valuations have changed, viability has changed, feasibility has changed. How can, how do you ask, how can you ask me? Because they are in the business of education. We thought this plan will be approved so that in the next academic year, we can, we can revive that company. Now that academic year is also gone. The second academic year is also gone. How do you expect us to revive a company which is in an edu education business? Two, there are certain government contracts which were given. Now those government contracts have certain validity. Now the company is not performing and those contracts have lost their validity. So therefore, my uh, valuation for the company has also gone down. Three, in the meantime, SFIO has started an investigation against Educom and there has been a whole lot of mismanagement, which the COC also pointed out and special investigation is going on. These facts were not known to us earlier. So these were the three grounds on which they wanted to withdraw. And NCLT, dismiss this application only on one cent in one sentence. There's a no ground made out in the application. We are dismissing the application. Just one sentence. But anyway, this, this judgment was not challenged before NCLAT, just like TCS did, but EBIX did not challenge it. They moved a second withdrawal application. And that application was moved on, say, in September 2019. So first was moved in July 2019. Second was moved in September 2019. And this second application was also dismissed because in the application they wrote that in the particular order, NCLT said you can file another application. So therefore, pursuant to the order of the NCLT, we are filing it. Now, NCLT said, where, in which order we said that you can file this? He said, sorry. We are dismissing this application, but we are giving liberty to file another application. I don't know how the NCLTs are functioning, but these, these are the facts of the case. Then they filed a third application in January 2020. Now, in the third application, when it was filed, this was allowed by NCLT. And they said, yes, we allow withdrawal. And their reasoning was, let us try to understand. Because the first objection which was taken by COC was that, look, the res judicata applies. I think most of the friends who are lawyers, probably they understand the meaning of res judicata. Those who are not, uh, res judicata means that if one issue has been decided <laughs> by a court, and if you file a second application on the same grounds, same cause of action, same relief, same parties, then that second application has to be dismissed because first it has been already been decided. So this is known as the principle of res judicata. So therefore, they, they took an objection that since their first application has already been dismissed, so res judicata applies, they can't move the second application or third application. This is the third application. But this argument was rejected by NCLT. They're saying that, look, in the first, uh, this thing, we consciously did not pass a detailed order. So therefore, and the second application, we gave them liberty. So therefore, this third application, there is no question of res judicata. That is one second ground they have done. And then the major ground which was taken, the major ground which was taken by them was that NCLT, before approving the plan, must look into the feasibility and viability and also can go into the question of implementation. Right? You look at section 31. Implementation is also mentioned is one of the things which, which can be looked into by NCLT. So they say there is an unwilling SRA who is not ready to enforce or implement. Now today, if we pass an order and tomorrow this does not implement, then where do we land up? What is the point? So feasibility, viability, implementation, this is a question which can be gone at this stage. 
So therefore, there is an unwilling SRA and we are not ready to, you see, approve the resolution plan like this. So therefore, they, they allowed withdrawal. So that was allowed. Naturally, appeal was filed by the COC against withdrawal. On the first occasion uh, in February 2020, NCLT gave a stay. And in the final judgment, they set aside the order of the NCLT. They said, and, and there were few grounds. Number one, that res judicata applies. Once their first application was already dismissed, where is the question of the third application? Number two, LCL, NCLT does not have any jurisdiction to allow withdrawal. Now, that was a major thing. Third, they said adjudicating authority cannot enter into the wisdom of the COC. Fourth, that IBC does not envisage any change in the resolution plan. And last ground, they also mentioned that application for approval of the resolution plan was already pending. So they could have decided that application rather than, uh, you see, allowing their application for withdrawal. So on these four or five grounds, five grounds are typically, they quash the order of the NCLT. Now, naturally, who is going to challenge this? Obviously, EBIX is going to challenge. So therefore, they went into the Supreme Court. So these are the facts of the case, right? So what the Supreme Court decided will deal with that. Similarly, uh, you see, it was a case uh, in Aston Field. Aston Field, Kundan Care also wanted to withdraw. So they also wanted to withdraw. They wanted to reevaluate because of some change circumstances, because of delay. Similarly, there was a third case. They wanted to amend the plan and also withdraw if the amendment is not allowed. That was in case of ARIA filament and the name of the resolution applicant was Seroko. So these were the three civil appeals taken together, passed in a common order. Facts were quite similar to each other. Now, friends, before we deal with Supreme Court, I just want to have your opinions. Forget about what Supreme Court says. Forget about what other courts say. Let us discuss and debate whether an SRA should be allowed to withdraw the plan or not. And if yes, what can be the grounds, right? So, because look at from this commercial point of view also. So tell me, uh, what is your opinion whether SRA should be allowed to withdraw the plan? And two, if yes, on what grounds? What could be the possible grounds? Supposing you are the SRA, you have filed a plan and the plan is pending for almost two years. Now, what factors will weigh in your mind uh, to, to, to ask for withdrawal? So anyone who wants to add, what could be the reasons for withdrawal? And should there be... A... Uh, I'm Ashok Kumar uh, Gulecha. As a layman, I think that yes, if it's un unreasonable delay, withdrawal should be permitted. If an unreasonable okay. delay, that's okay. as a layman. In a very simple okay. words. Aja, Mr. Gulecha, please tell me uh, what is the definition of reasonable delay and unreasonable delay? <laughs> no, no, see, sir, we have given the plan three months, four months, that's fine. Ah, okay. But okay. I have seen the cases that more than 18 months plan is yet pending. Right. And CLT, uh, COC has taken decision. Uh, I could not understand. They drag the matter for uh, 18 months, two years. Right, then right. unnecessary paying fees to I, uh, RP ongoing unit is going on and all the calculations of reservation applicant changes that's long period now more than one year and all these things okay so that, that so should be there okay so your argument is twofold uh, one the basic argument is that on a ground of delay uh, unreasonable that's delay as you mentioned and why because unreasonable delay causes a lot of problems it increases the cost of cirp that is one and two, it changes the entire basis on which you have submitted the plan. The viability gets affected. That is what you are trying to say. Correct. Okay. Sir. Great, sir. Yes, sir. Any, any, any other person who wants sir, to? Sir, sir, I, uh, I understand. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, force majeure clause should be applicable here. If in the resolution plan it is mentioned that because of force majeure clause, this plan can be uh, rejected, or uh, yeah, yeah, the, this uh, you know applicable plan can be uh, not implemented. <laughs> Only in that context, it should be seen. Achha. So you are saying that uh, RIS should not be allowed to withdraw the plan unless force majeure clause is there. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Sir, so, sir, so this means, uh, it... Sorry? Sir, when we yeah. talk everything about the accountability and time limit under IPC and RPs are so bound by the regulations and the rules, 
that they right. have to fulfill everything within a time limit right. you being a advocate what you feel that shouldn't judiciary be also have some time limit or this kind of things okay because Great. i think as we know everyone that 180 days resolution process should be completed but it is taking 2 years or more than 2 years then accountability is i don't know sir ke how this things are going on and uh, why resolution applicant should suffer or why rp should get fired firing for all this thing okay great sir again again an interesting observation uh, and ultimately it boils down to the fact that you see if there is a delay then <laughs> definitely it affects the ras and others also right so that is what and whether the time bound limit should also be applicable to judiciary or not right why why time limit should only be applicable to rps and not on the you see sir, uh, sir going one step forward even result uh, rp should also be allowed to withdraw from the process because <laughs> Okay. But you know, RP are facing so much problem from the authorities, and okay. they are not even getting the fees on time, or rather, they are keeping negotiating the fees. Right, right, right. I, 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 I really uh, don't, don't have a. You see, don't deny this. What you are saying. Okay. Uh, this is another observation. Yes, friends. Anyone else who wants to mention Wait, what sir, could be the grounds? May I come in, sir, with your kind permission? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yes. so i'll tell you one of my experiences so i was representing one fc in a matter resolution plan was before the adjudicating authority for approval and uh, it was the fc who brought to the notice of the adjudicating authority that the sra had lost the financial capability to execute the plan the adjudicating uh, okay. authority it it reverted the plan back to the coc in the meantime the sra withdrew from the plan so it did not given statement stating that we are withdrawing from the plan when this matter came up before the adjudicating authority the adjudicating authority without any discussion allowed a new form so they didn't even go into why whether it can be permitted not permitted mumbai bench they allowed new form when we went to appeal uh, before the enclad there also the chairperson's bench they were not willing to listen to the appellants they say that uh, we are only interested in resolution if resolution is happening then we are not looking at any other thing form g publication was granted to the companies so basically okay. what i say is that uh, benches are not interested the judiciary is not interested in knowing the reason these that anything they say that if we are getting resolution we are for it uh so i i just want to understand here you are saying on the one hand that nclt uh, considered that the financial capacity of the sra is lost so therefore they permitted them to withdraw is that correct no, they they reverted the uh, plan back to the coc now to take appropriate decision it is for the coc to decide in the matter so okay before, whether whether they should allow withdrawal or not okay uh, so basically to coc to take call because okay. it was see who brought to the notice of the bench that the uh, sra had lost the financial capability because sra the group companies of sra were facing section 9 and section 7 applications okay. sir uh, sir also, can i say something yeah yeah so can i can i add one point yes yes uh, because yeah so the whole thing is business related i think uh, for any business related issues there cannot be a binary answer to the question which you have asked we have to really see the context if we uh, this this case which you have so nicely uh, explained where actually see the academic year become the very very crucial uh, point for this business and when two academic years have been lost and you know one after the other letter on nclt tells them that they can withdraw first application second application and give another third application i mean these are really not expected in a crp issue this is this is from a should side but normally there cannot be something that someone can really withdraw the resolution then then you see the binding is gone there has to be binding there has to be also certain measures when such withdrawal is asked so that is uh, that goes without saying but if there is a genuine case and which has to be investigated and which has to be uh, evaluated uh, then uh, it should be allowed i mean 
uh, everything has a time value. You see, we we say the financial uh, you know credit is a time value for money. Similarly, for the resolution applicant, whatever he does, he does an assessment, and that is with respect to time only. That undue delay definitely you know can have a lot of impact. Yeah. Right. Okay. I think a uh, very good observation. Uh, in fact, you have brought in a very interesting point. Uh, rather, two points I would say that a ordinarily the the plan once submitted it should have a binding nature, so it should bind all the parties. Right. That is number yes, one. Yes, sir. Number two. Yes, sir. And in case in case the circumstances so warrant, uh, then they should also be allowed to withdraw because. There might be change in the circumstances, like this in the case of Edu Comp also, which was there. I think good observations you have mentioned. So this brings into a very interesting uh, point. Uh, you see, okay. Before I deal with that issue, also anyone else who wants to contribute, so that then I can take up all these issues, and then we will deal with the Supreme Court uh, judgment. Anyone who wants to add on to this, what our friends have already added. Okay. So let me let me consolidate what we have said. Number one, on account of delay, and uh, then Mr. Manoj Anand mentioned uh, force major that it should be allowed only in case of force major. So those, uh, I think, for the benefit of everyone, what is force major? Force major is like extraordinary circumstances, not the ordinary circumstances, but like supposing a country goes uh, into a war with another country. Now, obviously, uh, many supplies or many things can be can be changed. So, therefore, it is a force major. Force major could be an act of God also, right? Supposing uh, you see a flood takes place and the factory is a factory of the corporate debtor is 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 gone. So, those kind of issues are force major, which are not in the hands of the human beings. So, that is force major. So, he says only on force major this should be allowed. Otherwise, it should not be allowed. Then uh, uh, the the Time limit question was also raised by one of our friends. That is very important. Then losing financial capacity was also one of the interesting points which was brought in because there could be a circumstance. Supposing today, I am an SRA and I say that my net worth is so much. But then after a period of one year, my net worth goes down. Right At the time of submission of the plan, I was satisfying the eligibility criteria. And not only financial capability, there could be other reasons also. Because in one of our cases, it, this also this issue also arose. What happened? The plan was filed. Plan was approved by NCLT. But after the plan was approved, we came to know that the SRA they had some NPA accounts in Singapore, not in India. And they 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 defaulted to the tune of seven hundred fifty crores. This is not a small amount. So the question is whether the whether the eligibility under Section 29A is to be seen only at the time of submission of the plan, or at the time of the approval by the uh, adjudicating authority, or it can be considered even later also. So anyhow, but in that matter, what happened? The uh, SRA did not implement the plan de definitely because they did not have the financial capability. The COC, informal COC, or the stakeholders committee. They filed, moved an application, and they said, let the company be put into liquidation and let you decide that the plan has failed. So NCLT said, yes, plan has failed. They put the company into liquidation. Naturally, this order was challenged by the SRA before the NCLAT. NCLAT gave them another chance. He says, we are giving you another chance. Bring the money, implement the plan within three months or six months, whatever time limit is there. They could not do that. And when I appeared on behalf of the liquidator and I, I argued, I said, look, uh, that this issue, they have been given a lot of chances and we have not seen the color of money. So therefore, this liquidation order has to uh, remain. So ultimately, the, they, they upheld the order of the NCLT that they let the company go into liquidation. They went to Supreme Court also. And Supreme Court, again, uh, same judge was there who has given these two judgments, right? And our current chief justice. So... He, he he talked to me, he spoke to me, he said, and in fact, in the first hearing, Dr. Abhishek Singh was appearing on behalf of the SRA. And when I started speaking on behalf of the liquidator, he objected. He said, sir, what is the problem of the liquidator if the company is revived? He has no locus in this. So then, uh, uh, you see, the, the judge uh, asked me, he said, Mr. Mukija, what do you have to answer to that? 
I said, look, my lords, I am the officer of the court. I am there to assist. I am there to mention the few facts. And the fact of the matter is that they have, they have become ineligible because of 750 crore default in Singapore and they don't have the financial capacity. That is why they were given two chances, even by NCLAT, and they could not give the money. So he said, uh, Mr. Mukija, please tell me whether the requirement of 29A is to be seen at the time of the plan submission or I can see it today also. I said, Millards, today at the end of the day, idea is to revive the company. And if we give it to a person who does not have the financial capability, then what is the point? So if they are willing, if my lords are considering giving them another chance, please put them to strict terms. He said, yes, I agree with you. I will put them to stricter stop terms. He said, um, uh, Dr. Singhvi, I want your client to bring 30 crore of rupees within three months. Otherwise, I will, I will not consider this. And if you do not bring the money, then this plan will not be considered. Two, and whatever amount you deposit, and if you do not bring the full amount, then that amount will be forfeited. I'm putting you to the strictest of the terms. So they deposited around 15 crores, but they did not deposit the balance. And after three months when the hearing took place, and the judge straight away asked me, he said, Mr. Makija, has the money come? I said, Miller, the money has not come. And then he did not hear the opposite counsel. Mr. Vishwanathan was there as a senior advocate. He was not heard at all. And then the uh, order of the NCLAT was upheld that, yes, the company has to go into liquidation. And that 15 crore, whatever they deposited, was forfeited, was to be forfeited. So they became very strict on that. But that question was left open whether the financial capability of SRA can be seen at the later stage or not. But this is an important aspect. And then last is uh, one of our friends mentioned about the binding nature and uh, of the contracts also. Now, friends, one more question arises. Can the plans be conditional? Like if this condition is not satisfied, I will withdraw the plan. The, uh, like supposing I've asked for 10 relief. And those, if those 10 reliefs are not granted to me, I should be allowed to withdraw the plan. Then the plan should go away. Can the plans be conditional? Now, these are few questions which were which remain unanswered. But anyhow, let us deal with what the Supreme Court did. And probably some of the answers we will get that. Now, one of the arguments which took place in this particular judgment was that, look, there is no binding contract between the SRA and the corporate debtor and the COC, right? Because COC is on one side and SRA is on the second side. And of course, corporate debtor is also there. So once a plan is approved by the COC, it is a binding contract. The argument of the SRA's council was, that it is not a binding contract. It will become a binding contract only once approved by the adjudicating authority. Prior to that, it is simply an offer. And we know that under Indian contract, right, offer, acceptance, and all those things are there. So the Supreme Court naturally had to go whether this will form part of the contract or not. And interestingly, they divided the IBC into three stages. The first stage, they said when the plan is submitted and the plan is approved during the CIRP, this is the first stage. The second stage is when the plan is pending before the adjudicating authority and the CRP period is over, but plan is pending. So this is, we are in a state of a vacuum. So that is the second stage. And the third stage is when the plan is approved and it is to be implemented. So they divided IBC into three parts. And they said in the first stage, the law, the, the uh, provisions of IBC are very clear that how this the whole CRP process has to go on, uh, starting from uh, issue of expression of interest, issue of RFRP document, uh, releasing the list of prospective resolution applicants, then submission of the resolution plan then negotiations, and then approval by the COC. They said it is very, very clear, thought out process. Insofar as the third stage is concerned, once the plan is approved and it is to be implemented, even the law is clear on that aspect, right? Because the implementation is binding because section 31 talks about binding nature of the, con uh, of the resolution plans on all stakeholders. He said law is also clear. But the second stage, 
where the approval, uh, the resolution plan is pending for the approval. Now there is nothing, not even a single word in the IBC, whether the plans can be withdrawal or not. So if nothing is clear. So he says, we have to now actually talk about the second stage only. So they actually divide into three parts very interestingly. And they said, we will, we are going to deal with that. Now, friends, what I'll do is I'll just share my screen and share that judgment uh, with you. And I'll, because I marked out some important portions, which I want to read along with you. That's very, very important. I hope now you can see this. Now, the grounds of withdrawal. Now, these are the grounds of the withdrawal, which I mentioned. Number one, they said resolution plan was based on certain considerations that were fundamental to EBIC's bid for the business of Educom and were crucial for keeping the business of Educom as a going concern. And one of the consideration was the government contracts because Educom had a lot of government contracts for education due to inordinate delay. Now, this is the word because our one of our friends also used the word unreasonable delay. And here they have used the word inordinate delay in completion of the CIRP. Many of the government contracts may have ended naturally. And then they say, uh, the solutions which are provided by Educom are technology driven. Now, those technology is, is changing every day. So those technology is now not applicable because new technology has come. So I have bid on a certain ground at that time, but now the things have changed. Then uh, they also actually raised the issue of that 74% and later on 1%. They said it, initially it was not 75, later on it was there. Then they say there has been a lapse of three years, resulting in erosion of the vital business prospects of Educom. And they say implementation of viability is to be seen at the time of the consideration of the plan. Now, this was one of the important arguments. He says implementation and viability of a plan is not to be seen at the time of submission of the plan, but it must be seen by the adjudicating authority while they are approving the plan. So NCLT has rightly allowed that, look, uh, I'm an unwilling SRA, commercial viability is lost, so therefore I should be allowed to withdraw the plan. And then, of course, uh, they also raise an issue that uh, there was an investigation going on and these facts were not provided to us relating to the financial position and affairs and those kind of arguments were also taken place. Naturally, uh, RP will be blamed in, in many, most of the cases that he did not provide an information memorandum. Naturally, that is the uh, you see main argument in most of the applications whenever somebody wants to withdraw. So blame lies at the doorstep of the RPs. So that is also important. Okay. So now looking at uh, these things, then uh, uh, what the Supreme Court, while examining, they said, what is the purpose of the IBC? So they went back to the logic and the purpose. Now, what was the purpose? They said prior to IBC, there were various uh, laws which were there, uh, like SICA uh, was there, surface, recovery of debts, presidency towns. So all have been merged into a single code. And now what the what is anticipated is expected is that it is a time-bound framework. Because why those earlier laws failed? because there were delays. So therefore, what we expect is that the, those uh, delays will have to be cut down. In fact, they came down heavily on NCLTs also. I'll show that. Then they went to the nature of the resolution plan. So they said, what is the nature of the resolution plan? They got into those kind of details. So you can read some of those paras. I'm not reading it, but I'm just showing this. Now, then they came into the three stages, which I just mentioned. So this is given in para 103, friends. They say the first stage is prior to and ends with the approval of the resolution plan by the COC. The second stage is the interim period between the resolution plan approval by the COC and before its confirmation by the adjudicating authority. And third stage is after the approval of the resolution plan by the adjudicating authority. So they say first stage and second stage clarity is there in IBC. But insofar as the third second stage is concerned, we are concerning about that. So here say, however, what we are assessing right now is the interim second stage between both of those. To understand the relationship of the parties therein, it becomes important to understand the exact nature of the resolution plan. Whether 
this resolution plan is a binding contract between the parties or not. So everything boils down to whether it is of a binding nature because we all know that in case of when the plan is approved, it becomes binding. But once it is approved by COC and it is pending approval of the adjudicating authority, is it also still binding the parties or not? That was a question which the Supreme Court was to decide. And Supreme Court ultimately decided that, look, there is a whole process which has been uh, mentioned. There is a whole thought process which has gone into. And they went back to Ancitral, they went back to BLRC report, and they went back to insolvency, insolvency Law Committee reports also. And they said that the moment the plan is approved by the COC, it becomes of a binding nature of the contract. So please understand this. They, they also ruled out that, you see, they are they cannot be allowed to withdraw. They say it is it, it um, tent amounts because with open eyes, you had the complete information. You have submitted a plan. So therefore, we cannot allow you to take it back. And they went into, you see, Singapore law, UK law, and even US law also. In US, particularly, they noted that the plan once approved by the uh, court becomes a, you see, contract. Now, what happens in the contract? You know that if I treat something as a contract, and if I violate, the other party is liable for, uh, can claim damages. So here they said that in case in of India, the damages part is not mentioned. But here it attracts criminal uh, liability. That supposing once the plan is approved and the plan is not implemented, then a criminal case can be filed against, uh, you see, the, the SRA. So this was also one of the arguments taken by uh, EBICS people that look, IBC envisages that if I don't implement the plan, then you can prosecute me. But the stage of implementation has not come so far. Yeah, I've only submitted the plan, which is yet to be approved by the adjudicating authority. So I am entitled to withdraw and there is no penalty attached to it. So that was a counter argument which was taken, which was rejected by the Supreme Court because Supreme Court said, look, you may be right when you say that, but I will read that also in this, that if you wish or cannot be allowed to withdraw the plan because that process has gone and time bound is the essence. Now, assuming you are allowed to withdraw, he says it will open floodgates. Then every SRA will withdraw it. Then where, where will the success of IBC will lie? Now, naturally, everything now boils down to the main issue that number one, time bound nature. And I think very important question was raised by one of our friends also, that why the judiciary is not bound by it. So they came down very heavily on NCLTs. They said, look, time is the essence. You must decide the plans in a time-bound manner. In fact, they have mentioned this thing in uh, this particular judgment also. So they came down uh, very, very heavily on NCLTs. And uh, uh, they have also said that, look, insofar as withdrawal is concerned, now that power does not lie with the NCLTs. So, and they have also warned NCLTs that judicial restraint, they have used the word judicial restraint must be exercised by the adjudicating authorities in the matters which are relating to economic policy and interpretation of the economic statutes. So they said this will, otherwise, if you start allowing withdrawals, then the fate of IBC will be gone. It will also meet the same fate of surface. So here, the idea is because you are going through the process of negotiation, filing and plans and other things, now it consumes a lot of time, effort, and it involves money also. So once that process is done and your plan is approved, it is a binding nature. You have bound yourself. They have actually considered one of the factors because COVID was also argued that, look, COVID pandemic was also came and all those things. They said, yes, we recognize that fact. We are sympathetic to you that delays are happening, but we cannot allow you the withdrawal. So this was the ultimate judgment where it says that plan once filed 
by the SRA, it cannot be allowed to be withdrawn. This is one of the important things. Now, the second question which arises, I think one of our friends also mentioned whether losing of the financial capacity or knowing of certain facts which were not in the knowledge at that time when the plan was submitted, supposing new facts come into the knowledge about the conduct or the reputation of the, uh, the RA, whether they can be brought into the knowledge of uh, the, uh, you see, um, adjudicating authority or not, and whether they should be considered or not. Friends, the law is silent on this. On the contrary, if you go back to uh, Arsler Mittal judgment, versus Satish Kumar Gupta, first judgment under section 29A, the court's Justice Nariman has said that eligibility criteria is to be seen at the time of the submission of the plan. That's the law. So eligibility criteria is to be seen at the time of the submission of the plan and not before and not later. Now, this is still a gray area and there is no Supreme Court judgment that after the submission of the plan, at the time of submission of plan, the person was eligible, but supposing it becomes ineligible. Now let's take another example. Supposing the company which submitted a resolution plan also comes under CIRP. That, that there could be a situation, isn't it? Even, even the SRA can come under, uh, you see, CIRP. Now, whether a person which is already under CIRP should be allowed to, uh, you see, implement the plan. Now, the big question depends upon, again, the legal question. Go to section 29A. If a company is under CIRP, is it ineligible to submit a plan? 29A is silent, isn't it? 29A is silent. Unless, of course, you see it is an NPA. If it becomes an NPA and on that ground it is there, so then it is a different story. But otherwise, a company which is under CIRP, is it ineligible to submit a plan? So these are the questions, my dear friends, which still remain unanswered. But looking at the uh, EBIX judgment, Supreme Court is very clear in its mind when it says that the plan once submitted cannot be, uh, you see, uh, cannot be allowed to be withdrawn. In fact, they have also mentioned that IBC is silent on whether the SRA can withdraw its resolution plan. However, they have mentioned that statutory framework, which is given in our IBC and CIRP regulations, it provides a detailed step-by-step -step procedure to be followed and the absence of the exit route, because they say that, look, section 12A was brought in for withdrawal of the application, but that route is not available to SRA. So legislature with open eyes has not provided any exit route to the SRA. He says, if the legislature has not done it, and this is an economic statute, so the courts cannot bring their jurisdiction and try to, you see, interpret the law in a manner that look, uh, the withdrawal should be allowed. So they have rejected that particular argument. So friends, this is the judgment which stays as of today. Tomorrow, there may be a change in the jurisprudence. We don't know uh, based on certain uh, other conditions. So that will be there. In fact, as far as force major is concerned, which was raised by Mr. Manoj Anand, well, force major, whether you write down or not write down, force major is in any case applicable, isn't it? So obviously anyone can take the condition of extraordinary circumstances that can be taken. Here also COVID was also taken, but that was also rejected. He says, we are sympathetic to you, but we are not considering it. So these are the facts which are there. And Supreme Court has also mentioned that conditional plans cannot be accepted. So plan has to be completely unconditional, friends, for that matter. So this is also very, very important judgment to that extent. Okay, so friends, I think uh, we have already taken a lot of time. So any uh, any question or any other observation, feedback, comment? May I come in, sir? Yeah, yeah, please. 
sir like uh, the decision in ubix was that if the plan is approved by the coc and pending approval before the adjudicating authority the plan cannot be withdrawn right, right. but down the line benches sir are not following this not the uh, nclt adjudicating authority not the appellate authority so they are freely allowing withdrawal of resolution plan that is what my experience is and actually they were dismissive they said if they want to withdraw there cannot be an issue and although 900 days has passed sir, one of the observations in abix is that if uh, the process cannot go beyond 330 days if the process goes beyond 330 days it necessarily calls for liquidation but then even after end of 900 days the benches are allowing a new form g to be published that is one of my observation sir you mentioned that plan cannot be conditional so regulation uh, 36a7 says that the expression of interest shall be unconditional so if correct. the expression of interest is unconditional the plan naturally has to be unconditional sir correct right? correct, correct because yeah. this this provision was brought in later on because at the end of the day people were submitting the conditional plans so conditional yeah. plans cannot be accepted sir and one more observation sir on section 29a sir in hmm. 29a only under clause p does it mention at the time of submission of the resolution plan has an account right so right. what i right. want to bring out of this is that i want to lead a proposition that only if there is an npa account then the eligibility in eligibility has to be seen at the time of submission of the resolution plan for all under parameters which are mentioned for disqualification i believe the moment uh, the there is disqualification uh, you become disqualified under section 29a so to give an example like the at the time of submission of resolution plan one of the sra is not convicted but after the submission of resolution plan the plan is uh, allotted to him the one of the partners of the sra is convicted i believe the disqualification should follow and it should not be that at the time of the submission of the resolution plan the sra was eligible okay see uh, there are uh, two three issues which you have raised of course i think 36a7 we have already discussed that it can't be uh, conditional so i think all of us agree now on 29a now see the problem with 29a is it can't be so dynamic please understand that that's it will create a problem because situations are so dynamic then on every day uh, will will rp is rp supposed to check 29a at every stage so i i am talking from the viewpoint of the rp so rp will definitely do a check of 29a when the plan is submitted that's all now he will not be in a dynamic position to check the eligibility every time of course if something is brought to his knowledge that should be brought to the knowledge of the adjudicating authority like uh, if he becomes a willful defaulter if he is this is treated as an undischarged insolvent then of course those conditions have to be seen but uh, there is no really a judgment on this that other conditions have to be seen at the time of approval of the plan or these conditions have to be seen at the time of the submission of the plan but if we go by the arcelor mittal not only 29a c they said all the conditions must be seen at the time of the submission of the plan so those are the things which are there but definitely if there is a change circumstance it must be brought to the knowledge of the adjudicating authority now having said that last point before i wind up you also mentioned that uh, many adjudicating authorities are permitting and they are not following ebix now that is not correct if that is the case they will have to be brought to it this judgment has to be brought to their knowledge because this is a supreme court judgment which must be followed by all ncs so if they are simply permitting filing of uh, publishing of the form g once again because sra wants to withdraw then that is not the correct uh, jurisprudence if they are allowing uh, publication of the form g again on the ground other than the withdrawal of by the sra then it's a different story altogether then it's a different story like natural justice were not followed the plan was approved wrongly by coc so they reject that and then they say okay publish it again that's that's a different story altogether but otherwise withdrawal by ra or ra cannot be permitted makesh sir shall i say something yes right see abix abix was not allowed to withdraw the plan abix was sra you know what is the fate of the cd i mean crp what happened to that crp 
so obviously when they are not allowed so definitely the, the sra was whether liquidation asked, is ordered whether liquidation is ordered no 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 sra was not allowed to withdraw that means the plan was approved so once the plan is approved they have to implement the plan okay. that is the case okay okay yes i think uh, uh, i think somebody else also raised uh, the hand so maybe if somebody wants to contribute okay so i think uh, friends if there are no more questions i i have taken a lot of time so maybe uh, we can now wind up the session uh, over to anuji i think if you can take it over from here for your closing comments thank you anuji. sir for taking up the wonderful session it was very informative sir thank you okay thank you friends thanks a lot thank you thank you sir thank you thank you master it's always a pleasure listening to you sir इट्स माई प्लेजर सर थैंक यू सो मच थैंक्स फॉर अप्रिशिएट मिलते रहेंगे हम मिलते मिलते रहेंगे रहेंगे बार बार